So I was in the middle of talking about the iris. <clears throat> so one thing about the iris to remember is the iris is distinctive. This is why there's iris scanning machines that can confirm your identification, much like a fingerprint. And right behind the pupil here, we have the lens. And the lens focuses incoming light rays into an image on the retina back here. And the retina is the multi-layer tissue on the eyeball's sensitive inner surface. Um, so when the lens focuses the rays and the lens can change its curvature, this is accommodation. So the definition for accommodation is the process by which the eye's lens changes, changes shape to focus near or far objects on the retina. So some details about the retina. So the retina is the part of the eye that is converting these particles of light energy into the neural impulses, and then these are forwarded to the brain. Um, so that process is transduction. So that gets us to phase three of vision. So here we have a zoomed in image um, of the back of the retina, and we see the light coming in. And by the way, this is the favia, just zoomed in on the favia, the point of central focus. Um, so here we have the light coming in, and at first, it goes to the back layer here. And these rods and cones are receptor cells. So the receptor cells recepting, receiving um, that impulse, the energy. And remember, rods detect black, white, and gray. These aren't necessary for peripheral vision and twilight vision. And they're very sensitive to a faint amount of light. This is why you can see fairly well um, with very limited light. And then we have the cones, and the, the cones are concentrated near the center of the retina by the favia and they function in daylight or well-lit conditions and they can detect fine detail and and the cones are what give rise to color uh, one memory aid for me is cone color cc so when these neural signals are sparked the bipolar cells are activated here they are and the bipolar cells activate the ganglion cells there they are and the ganglion cells then connect um, to the optic nerve and actually the optic nerve is all the axons from the ganglion cells and they converge to form that optic that optic nerve and notice here there are no receptor cells there's no rods and cones there's no receptor cells this is your blind spot um, so this is where the receptor cell or where the optic nerve leaves the eyes and there's a bit of a hole there um, if you follow the directions on that vision handout that i gave you um, if you read around that handout, it'll show you how to find your blind spot, what you can do, and you can see your blind spot. So here we have that description of transduction I talked about in class on Tuesday, and here you can see better um, what's actually happening in the brain. So there's our optic nerve. It crosses, and the information goes to the thalamus. Remember, the thalamus is where all sensory input goes except for the sense of smell and then it's sent to the cerebral cortexes. Remember, that's the occipital lobe. And that place where the optic nerves cross is called the optic chasm. So then we have the final phase of vision in the brain. So that information goes to the visual cortex. And you have feature detectors. These are specific areas of the brain that respond to specific things. So one name you want to remember here regarding feature detectors are the names David Hubel and Torsten Weisel. These names are listed on the packet that I gave you with the key vocabulary in the front of it. This is the um, sensation and perception packet. I believe it's blue. Um, you need to know these names. These guys won the Nobel Prize and they are responsible, responsible for demonstrating that neurons in the occipital lobe's visual cortex receive information from individual ganglion cells in the retina. So they showed what I just described to you. And um, they found that these feature detector cells get their name from their ability to respond to a scene specific features. So there are specific cells that are, their primary purpose is just for um, paying attention to edges or lines or angles or movements. There are um, specific cells that do each of these specific jobs. So Hubel and Weissel um, found those things and won the Nobel Prize back long, long ago, back in 79.
Um, so this work that they did is really the research and the work behind this amazing ability for us to perceive faces. Um, they found that there are there is a team of cells that you would call these supercell clusters um, where they work together and this is an, actually an area in your temporal lobe just behind your right ear and they work together to enable you to perce perceive faces. Um, so if there's damage to that region you might be able to recognize forms, objects, maybe have perfect vision yet you can't recognize familiar faces. So what's amazing about our brains is that we have these feature detector cells that are firing all at the same time. And this is what allows us to engage in parallel processing. You're doing many things at once. So you have different cells that are um, perceiving information from a visual scene. So color, movement, form, depth. Um, we have cells that, that are detecting all of those features all at the same time, and this is another form of what parallel processing is. You probably remember that term um, from the memory chapter, and it's the same term, it's just apply, applied in a very specific way in this text. So that's why the turkey's sitting there with a gun. That's a really weird picture. So here's that handout that I gave you in class today. I hope you got it. If you didn't, talk to me tomorrow. Um, you, I also put it up on Moodle so you can print it off for yourself. But take a moment right now, pause this video, find that handout, take a look at it, read all of these details. These are important things for you to know. So now we finally get to color vision. So remember through this that color resides not in the object itself, but in the theater of our brains. We can actually discriminate 7 million different color variations. Um, this would be considered the difference threshold for colors. Now there's two major theories regarding how we see color and how some people have color deficiency. You need to be familiar with both of these because they actually work together. Let's start with the opponent process theory. So this theory states that the sensory receptors come in pairs. There's a red-green red pair, yellow-blue pair, and a black-white pair. And if one color is stimulated, the other is inhibited. So this theory explains the after image that you experienced in class. When you stare at a green square for a while and then you look at a white sheet of paper, you're going to see red because of this red-green combination. When you stare at a yellow square for a while and then look at a white sheet of paper, you're going to see its opponent color blue. A man named Ewald Herring, H-E-R-I-N-G, came up with this opponent process theory. The other theory you need to know is the trichromatic theory. So this theory states that there's three types of cones. Remember cones color. Cones are what allows you to see color. And cones do their magic with a team of three. So they do their magic together. And if you put these three types of cones together, they are what can make the millions of combinations of color. I know you're probably thinking, wait, wait a minute, what about yellow? Yellow is one of those primary colors. It's supposed to be red, blue, and yellow. But actually, um, yeah, that makes sense in art class when you're mixing paint. But um, when both red sensitive and green sensitive cones are stimulated, we see yellow. This theory, the trichromatic theory, is actually the older of the two theories, and it's a good one for how we see color. Um, the problem is it doesn't explain the after images or color blindness very well. So the prior theory, the opponent process theory, helps to explain those. So when you think about people who have color deficiencies, usually that's coming from that opponent process theory. Um, red and green go together. So people who suffer red-green blindness, they have trouble perceiving the number within the, the design. Um, this number here is 74. Can you perceive it? Um, and, and that's because maybe they're having trouble with that red-green um, opponent process. Um, Yellow-blue would be another one, and uh, generally people don't have problem with white and black. And here's those after images that we did in class. If you want, um, stare at this picture for a minute, and then stare at the white, and again, stare at this picture for a minute, and stare at the white. And you can see that after image and how that connects with the opponent process theory. Um, Red-green 
yellow, blue, and then of course white and black. So with these two theories working together, we now know that color processing occurs in two stages. The first stage is where the retinas, red, green, and blue cones respond in varying degrees to different color stimuli. Think of it as a mixing a bunch of paints together to, to make all of the, the different color variations, the seven million different color variations that we can see. And number two, their signals are then processed by the nervous system's opponent process cells and route to the visual cortex. And this is how we interpret what we see. Uh, here's an image for you. I, I always found this interesting. If you think about um, what kind of emotion does color elicit, this is various products and their marketing technique, something to think about. And I'll end the show for now. The bell's about to ring. Hopefully I'll get uh, hearing put up later. So this is um, video number two for you.